Morning, everybody. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Copyright and Online Teaching in a Time of Crisis webinar number 35. It's the 35th webinar. Yes, very good to uh, have you all back again. Looking so like I'm, ja I'm Jane Tecker. Yeah, I'm Chris Morrison. So we've got another, uh, I think, good session coming up. Should we have a look at what's coming up today? Let's do that. Yeah. So we've got some uh, a, a, quite a few things uh, in the copyright news. There always seems to be things to talk about. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, uh, going through a number of there's Well, there's a letter, there's a court case, there's an interview, there's some events coming up. Um, so we are looking forward to that. But then today uh, we have an excellent guest, a regular um, on the podcast, um, Claire Kidwell. Um, from Trinity Love and Conservatoire is going to be talking to us about notated music. So we're looking forward to that. We are aren't very, we? Much. very much. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, and um, we, we've, we've got our sort of future webinars, all the kind of usual stuff. So um, let's, without further ado, get cracking, Chris. Let's and, do it. Uh, what are we starting with? <gasps> well, yeah, this week. Look, we've got this some, uh, some. We we turned into a cartoon. We've been cartoonized, haven't we? We have. We have. Yeah. Uh, I would recognize myself anywhere, actually. I think it's so obviously me. And yes. you with your fabulous hair. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's it's, it's, it's been I, immortalized, your lockdown hair. They have, yes, absolutely. So um uh we'll come back to where these come from um later on. It's one part of the news item, but we thought we would share this with you because we we quite like these, don't we? We do, we do. We're, yeah. we're, we're thinking maybe of a whole cartoon series, aren't we? Where we can get them animated so they move around and they do things. Maybe, maybe they sing, maybe they sing. Maybe. I maybe one of them could sing really well in the cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we'll get actually somebody who could sing to do the voice for for me. <laughs> so, yes, that's, that's how exciting. And of course, it's been Easter. Many people have been off. Quite a lot of people yeah. are probably still on leave. And so we hope you've all had a lovely break, had a bit of downtime. Mm. Um, I've spent a lot I've of time been, in the garden. I've been doing a lot of baking. So everything mm. in the house is coated with a thin layer of bread dough. Um, mm. So, yeah, no, it's been good. Right. So a reminder that we have all of the previous webinars on our archive. So uh, we can share the link, can't we? Whoever it is that's putting the links, it's me. I've got the link. I'm going to copy and paste it. You love it when I narrate what I'm doing technically, don't you? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you, if you do that and I'll move on to the next uh, thing, which I think is something for you to do anyway. So it is but, um, yeah, 35 webinars. It's quite an achievement. OK, Chris. Right then. OK, so um, I um, picked up this uh, piece of news um, and I don't know if you can pop the link into the chat for this, um, Chris. Um, okay. This this is um, from a US university um, and um, I'm just trying to remember what BYU stands for. Brigham actually. Young it's University. University, that's it. In, yes. In Utah. And um, they are clearly having some quite similar discussions um, in US universities on um, the streaming of films for educational use. Um, so I spotted this tweet um, about a petition um, that they have um, set up. Um, and there's a letter where you can sort of put your name on it to support it. Now, obviously, completely aware that the situation, the law in the US is different. Um, but what I just thought was worth highlighting here was that this is pretty much the exact same issue. So it's kind of whether you can circumvent um, a, a TPM such as DRM technology that's on DVDs and whether you, you know, you should be allowed to use um, uh, DVDs and films for um, remote learning, as they call it, sort of online learning. So exactly the same kind of issues um, being discussed. And it will just be really interesting, I think, to see um, what, what the outcome of this is in the US. 
it is because what, what they're the, specifically focusing on here is the circumvention of technical protection measures and, and the uh, provisions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is what um, is in place in the US. So we have something similar here that we've spoken about um, in relation to, to UK law and, and EU law. So these things are all uh, they're separate legal systems, but they are clearly linked and there are some principles that they will be looking at across the different countries and thinking, well, how do we get, get yeah, teaching material? I did, I, I've also spotted Bart's joined us this morning, so I don't know if it's something um, he picked up on and had followed it at, at all. But I think it's just something for us to keep an eye on about what, what's going on um, there. So, yeah, if you've got mm -hmm. anything to add, Bart, we'll, we can come back to it um, But as we go through the rest of the news. Um, yeah. so. so the next news item is also coming from the United States um, and here's a link to a BBC news article about it but many of you will have seen um, this I think in, in various uh, different media outlets so clearly it's something that's of uh, have I got there before you Jane there we go there's the link um, Google versus Oracle, which is a uh, copyright lawsuit that's been going on for 10 years. It's been going on for a very, very long time with some really important questions being decided um, over the use of uh, APIs, application programming interfaces. It's about Google's use of Oracle's APIs in the creation of the Android operating system. Um, and there's a number of different aspects of this case uh, but the one that, that, that this judgment has, has clarified is that um, it's fair use so it's been seen that Google's use of Oracle's code was fair use now there are other arguments there about whether the code itself should be subject to copyright protection at all because these we're talking about um, application programming interfaces there's, there's an argument a very strong argument I would say that they are equivalent to to languages that we speak, that there shouldn't be any one company that's in control of a language that allows different technologies to interface with each other. So uh, I don't think it's worth trying to summarize it in any, any more than that, um, because I think this is a subject, I mean, clearly it's worth, worthy of a lot of discussion about what its implications are. So I think it's something we'd like to come back to um, mm. and thinking about how this specifically relates to um, learning technologies and interfacing and code and ownership and proprietary versus open. I think this is this is something that we've touched on in these webinars. I think that's the angle that I think we'd like to explore more. Uh, but just to say this is a pretty this is an extremely important ruling, even if we're not based in the US because because of the of, you know the the, the the fact this is technology that's used throughout the world and it's the, the you know it's google it's 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 oracle it's these big tech companies working out the the basis on on which uh code can be used and its legality yeah i studied some of it actually when i did the harvard copyright x course so they were where it had got to because it was it's it, even before this latest judgment there was a, a lot of backwards and forwards in wasn't there for many years mm -hmm. and we yeah, we studied yeah. it there so yeah i think i think it would be interesting um and not to talk, put people up to it but i think to hear kyle courtney's take on it because he's mm. been commenting about it and also emily hudson will have uh, views on this about how it relates mm. to the, the stuff from from her research as well okay Absolutely. so should we uh, look to the next a news item which Let's is do that. where so, those cartoons came from yes um so um about a month or so ago um chris and i had a really good um chat with matt east who works for talis um sort of um a bit on the back of um some of the interest there's been about the talis elevate um product um so this uh, for people who don't know is um so it's a more it's it's not the reading list tool from talis it's where you can put readings um into it and it's primarily aimed at academic staff to use with students to get students to do more active reading so they can kind of have discussions they can add annotations to the readings um, and obviously, um, some of the issues that people have flagged up is kind of, oh, what about copyright with a product like that? I mean, actually, there are quite a lot of other tools that are out there that do similar things. 
um and um you know i, I think we, we kind of go into some of some of those issues towards the end of the interview but actually it was just a really great chance for us to just waffle on about copyright a bit more wasn't it chris really and to get some cartoons made so it was. Yeah. yeah absolutely so in, in the way that when you see um people on social media talking about whether they have been paid for promotion or anything just to say that, that there was none of that oh, going no, no, on no. we were given no. an opportunity by Talis to talk about the things that were important to us for copyright literacy um about the new uh copyright and online learning special interest group and get the word out there um so clearly it's worth saying other products are available <laughs> there are other uh, notation bits of software we're sort not in sounds any way a little bit like you're trying to justify that they didn't give you a pair of trainers or something they like didn't. that Chris. well they gave no. us some, some cartoons which is nice they but did um, give some cartoons yes yeah which was, but, it, which is, which was but we also nice. took but, it as an opportunity to promote the alt special interest group as well didn't we, we? Did, so we absolutely we we chatted a bit about that to to matt as well and what the kind of uh, community that you know we were building was 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 doing and and continuing to do so something to listen to on those cold and chilly and wet spring evenings <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So the next thing as well, events now we've got there. Um, I mentioned Emily, uh, Dr. Emily Hudson, uh, put the link to this on the list. It's actually later today. So if you've missed Emily talking about her book, Drafting Copyright Exceptions, there's another opportunity uh, this afternoon at six o'clock. And she's on a double bill with Martin Sentflaben, who is talking about his work in patents as well. Um, so they are, uh, or trademark, I think it is, the copyright trademark interface, uh, excuse me, yeah. Um, so there's a good opportunity there to catch up with more about uh, how copyright exceptions are used in practice. Uh, and then the next event. Sorry, I, I just to let you know, I beat you there. I got the link in to that one. Well so done. I'm very proud of myself. That's kind of made you, made my weekend. Should. Yeah. Um, yeah, next one is me. So the, the OER X Domains Conference um, is coming up um, later this month, 21st to the 22nd of April, um, run by or supported by the, the Association for Learning Technology, organised by the Association for Learning Technology. And um, it's a great conference. We've spoken to it. Uh, we, we've spoken at it before um, mm -hmm. and um, we chat a bit about it when we uh, interviewed uh, Maren um, from Alt um, in our Copyright Waffle podcast. Um, but um, the event is going to be, um, yeah, for two days online, but we've also got a presentation um, or a sort of workshop session, haven't we, for the Alt Special Interest Group on Copyright and Online Learning. We I've got, absolutely I've, do. I've got another presentation as well, actually, based oh, well, on well, my um, module I teach, which is also happening. On, I think that one's happening in the morning of the 22nd. Our one is the evening, I think, of the 21st, isn't it? Yes, it is. I was trying to find the link to the programme, and I think the programme seems to be, the link I found seems to be taking me to the pre-conference workshops. But I, if you follow uh, that link, you should be able to get access to it. Um, the, uh, I think just I've done to say it that again. That's, you've that's got the list it. You've of the programme. I've beaten you. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, well done. The, but I also wanted to draw people's attention to, um, there are other uh, copyright related uh, presentations um, and one of them is from the American team who've worked on the codes of best practice for open educational resources so that is on uh, the same day that, that uh, we're doing our cool SIG presentation at 20 past four so that will be good as well to, yeah, to see what like they've been really doing in the session. US. Yeah yeah mm -hmm. and it is always an excellent conference I mean just just having a sort of quick squiz through the program. I mean, always they have international speakers and, you know, I can see people coming from all around the world, obviously, because it's online as well. It's in some ways made it more um, accessible as well. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. But so talking of excellent international conferences. Yes, um, yes. Oh, we oh. have an announcement that the I call for contributions it's not ice pops we need a jingle. i can't believe it's not ice pops we okay yeah yeah we yes, do absolutely. need we need a jingle. jingle yes yes yeah. we'll get that yeah. sorted yeah um, it is uh now live so we've this is just to, to remind people or to let you know if you weren't aware um 
Ice Pops, we have run two very successful sessions of the International Copyright Literacy Event with Playful Opportunities for Practitioners and Scholars in 2018-2019. The 2020 edition was postponed to this year, but then we made the decision to postpone it another year because getting together face to face in June really wasn't going to be possible. But this is the free online event. We've already got confirmation that a number of speakers who were due to speak at uh, the face to face event will be joining us online. Um, and we've now put out the call to ask for others to see if they want to do either a lightning talk or take part in the World Cafe sessions where they get to demo their ideas or their projects and, and, and talk to people um, about how they work and get feedback or just spread the word really so mm. it's there if you it want is. if you have an idea yeah and it's um on a friday so probably starting uh -huh. at 11 o'clock so many of you will be tuning into our webinar so um we've decided to run it at a similar time but it's basically like a webinar that runs all day <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, no, you are going to have a lunch break, and um, but we are we are going to have an evening social, aren't we, Chris? Where rumor yes, has that it, is the there plan. might there might be some singing. Right. So. Well, we will provide more information closer to the time, but it is, should be will be a lot of fun. It will be. Oh, I've got a cat on the desk now. Oh, right. Um, speaking of music. I think yeah. this is the opportune moment to introduce our guest speaker, isn't it? I think we're at the I end of it, copyright I news. Think it is. Yes, yes, I think so. So, um, one of the most fabulous music librarians that there is is who we're very grateful is joining us. Um, if I can, shall I control the slides? I'm trying to control the cat and the slides at the moment. Yes. So. The very fabulous Claire Kidwell, who is the head librarian at Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance, is about to join us on this webinar. Um, Claire, unfortunately, I think isn't going to sing um, at the moment um, uh, and she's not going to do stand up. I think we're, we're trying to work out whether this was shortly before or shortly after she did her one and only copyright stand up um, stint at the Ice Pops conference, which but for those of us who are there have have never forgotten Claire so um but you're actually going to talk to us about a fairly serious subject about the document supply of notated music by libraries aren't you so Claire That's correct Jane um I'm afraid there are no rude jokes in this in this presentation uh, at all very Unless Perhaps anyone we stop the recording, stop the recording. <laughs> I say unless you anyone you... picks one up that I've not noticed in writing it, but <laughs> in which case do tell me. Okay. Um, okay. So let's get your slides up, Claire. Chris, are you doing that? Am I doing that? <laughs> okay. Right. Take it away, Claire. Thank Marvelous. you. Marvellous. Thanks Thank for joining you very us. Much. <clears throat> Okay, so very pleased to be joining uh, everyone today. I will um, start by saying that I know that not everyone listening in will necessarily be coming with a musical background. So I'm going to try to avoid any um, esoteric terminology as far as possible. Um, but if anyone wants anything clarified, um, stick it in the chat and perhaps um, Chris can either type an answer in if he, if he feels he can or jump in to ask, to ask me to explain. So to start uh, with a bit of context. So uh, YAML is the International Association of Music Libraries, Archives and Documentation Centres, uh, which is made up of a number of national branches, including the UK and Ireland branch. And the branch has a number of committees uh, tasked with particular aspects of the profession. And I chair the Trade and Copyright Committee. So our remit is to advise the branch on issues relating to intellectual property, particularly copyright and licensing as they affect music library profession and to deal with issues relating to the profession's relationship with publishers and suppliers of music material. Um, we have eight members who currently come from a national library, two conservatoires, a university, a public library, a resource centre supporting new music and a music publisher as well. So we've got broad representation across a variety of sectors, including rights holder input. Um, and the seat 
this study was planted by our public library representative at the time who said that her library sometimes received requests from users for reproductions of printed music but that wasn't a service that they had previously offered and she wondered what libraries did. So we discussed this in one of our meetings and thought there would be merit in circulating a survey to find out what current practices were in place, identify any obstacles to utilisation and consider whether there was any guidance that we could usefully produce to support libraries in offering such a service. So we circulated the survey link to the YAML UK and Ireland, List Copy Seek, List ILL, that's Interlibrary Loan, and the Library Association of Ireland Academic and Special Libraries email lists. So although the survey itself was framed within the context of UK copyright legislation, Irish copyright law is substantively the same in this specific area, hence we welcomed responses from Irish libraries too. And we received responses from 21 libraries altogether. So obviously that's not by any means comprehensive, but nevertheless we were satisfied that the sample size was large enough for us to be able to draw some broad conclusions. In terms of the uh, breakdown of respondents by sector, 43% uh, were academic libraries, 33% public libraries, 10% national libraries, and 14% other types. And of those respondents, only 38% offered library privilege copying for published music scores. Claire, can I just jump in here mm -hmm. and ask you what the yeah. number of respondents was? Maybe you'd said that, but just to put yeah. those graphs Twen into tech context. 21. Oh, great. OK, thank you. Um, and then um, of the 62% that didn't uh, offer a library privilege copying for published music scores, uh, a number of reasons were quoted which broadly fell into three categories. A lack of time or staff resource, a lack of expertise or confidence in that area, which included uh, difficulties in making judgments, and in some cases, a perceived uh, lack of demand. We asked what criteria libraries use when deciding what constitutes a reasonable proportion of a published music score. The most common responses were 5% of a work and one work from an anthology. And other responses were a page or so, a single movement, one aria from an opera or oratorio, and a practice orchestral part. Moving on to unpublished works, 24% uh, of respondents offered library privilege copying for unpublished scores, 33% didn't offer that service, and the remaining 43% didn't actually hold any unpublished scores in their collection. Um, all those who did offer the service were aware that the legislation permits copying of uh, entire works for unpublished scores, subject to some uh, other restrictions that exist. The reasons quoted by those not offering the service broadly fell into four categories. So uh, similarly to published scores, a lack of resource or expertise. Also, in some cases, a lack of access to materials. And I think that was generally the case where document supply is dealt with through a centralised service, but unpublished materials are perhaps kept within special collections departments, which are separately managed. Conservation reasons and a perceived lack of demand. So to pull that all together, the majority of libraries who responded did not exercise these library privilege exceptions in relation to music scores, and those that did offer such a service didn't actively promote it. The primary obstacle for published material appears to be the lack of confidence in how to apply the reasonable proportion stipulation of section 42A to printed music. And indeed, <clears throat> um, Respondents from libraries that did offer the service also commented that they felt uncomfortable making those decisions. And I think this is further exacerbated by the fact that many libraries operate an autonomous document supply department, which is unlikely to include music specialists. In the case of unpublished material, a wider range of obstacles exists, not all of which are likely to apply exclusively to music. So, for example, conservation considerations. 
The fact that, <clears throat> that um, complete works can be copied removes the difficulty of making those quantitative judgments. However, research is still involved in ascertaining that a work is definitely unpublished. Um, and within the field of music, that wouldn't just be limited to the publication of the notated score, as a musical work also counts as being published if it's been manifested in a sound recording or a film that has been issued to the public. So from the results of this survey, it became clear to us that there would be some benefit in um, interrogating the legislation and providing some guidance to help libraries uh, in interpreting it. So we started off looking at the history of the library privilege exceptions that allowed for copying on behalf of users. And the provision was first uh, introduced in Section 7 of the 1956 Copyright Act, which allowed libraries to provide a researcher with a single copy of an article from one issue of a periodical, as, as is still the case today. Um, and librarians could also supply a reasonable proportion of a literary, dramatic or musical work, but only where the librarian didn't know or couldn't ascertain the name and address of the rights holder. The phrase reasonable proportion uh, wasn't defined anywhere in the Act and didn't appear anywhere else in the text. And in fact, the same has remained true in all successive iterations of the legislation. In the 1988 Copyright Designs and Patents Act, the uh, library privilege exceptions were spread over a greater number of sections and copying of periodical articles and other types of work were split over sections 38 and 39 respectively. So for library, dramatic and musical works, again, the copying was limited to a reasonable proportion but there was no longer the caveat of the exception only applying when it wasn't possible to contact the rights holder. And then following the 2014 revisions, uh, they were brought back together again under section 42A and extended to cover all types of copyright work, not just the literary, dramatic and musical ones. So we spent a little bit of time considering whether we could attach any significance to the fact that the title of that section changed from parts of published works in 1988 to single copies of published works in 2014 and whether that might have been pointing potentially towards a whole work being considered a reasonable proportion. But we concluded that actually the change in title was simply down to the fact that the periodicals and other types of works were being brought back together into a single section. And because it allowed copying of whole articles, that's why uh, the word parts was then omitted. So next we turned to the uh, secondary literature to see what copyright scholars had written about this exception. And in many instances, authors made reference to the reasonable proportion requirement but remained silent on the question of how you actually interpret that. Additionally, some sources completely omit any reference to musical works in their discussion of section 42a, which I think might be, you know, might contribute to libraries' reluctance to offer this service. As we've said, there's no definition of reasonable proportion in the Act. Um, Lacker's guidance on copyright declaration forms states a reasonable proportion generally means that only a limited part that is necessary for the research or study purpose can be copied. Uh, Graham Cornish says a general view from the publishing industry has been that 10% or a chapter might be reasonable. Although this is not a legal de definition, it's a helpful guideline. Tim Padfield says that in the absence of any definition in the legislation, the best advice is to restrict copying to the same quantities as for fair dealing. And in relation to fair dealing, he states, in general, for any kind of work, 5% should always be fair. For musical works, what is copied should not be performable. Now, <clears throat> obviously, any quantity of a musical work could theoretically be performable, but I followed up with Tim who confirmed that what he's referring to here is either a whole work, an identifiable part of a work or a specific section. 
And then the UK Music Publishers Association has a code of fair practice in which they set out their own interpretation of the law as well as additional specific circumstances under which their publisher members agree not to take action. For example, copying a page to avoid an awkward page turn or making an emergency copy when someone loses their music in the immediate run up to a performance. Uh, speaking from a conservatoire, I can tell you that is a fairly common uh, occurrence. Um, in terms of section 42a, they simply say that librarians may make or supply the musical work and they don't go into any further detail on that. However, in their section on uh, research and private study, they say um, students or teachers may make copies of short excerpts of musical works provided that they are for study only and not performance. Copying whole movements or whole works is expressly forbidden under this permission. Now, of course, copying of whole movements or works is not expressly forbidden in the law, even if they as the industry body might wish it were. And that's their own interpretation of fairness. And I think that leads us on nicely to one of the uh, particular difficulties in relation to music, which is defining what constitutes a work, a term also not defined in, in CDPA. Uh, large scale musical works are often subdivided into constituent parts, songs or movements, which may stay up, stand up entirely by themselves and be performed autonomously. Although it's not a term that appears in the UK or indeed uh, US copyright legislation, um, there's a voluntary set of guidelines agreed by a variety of stakeholders for the educational use of music in the USA, which makes to the concept of a uh, performable unit, providing examples of a section, movement or aria. And I think this is quite a helpful concept in the consideration of issues such as extent limits and fairness within the context of musical works. So I've picked a particular example from stock in my library to demonstrate this issue. And I know this is one that Jane was quite excited uh, about. So, a song from Yay. a musical. <laughs> I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't about to sing, but you know, <laughs> I could I could be persuaded. I'll let you carry on, Claire. <laughs> Jane's favourite musical and favourite animal combined in one. So. Oh. <laughs> So a song from a musical could be considered a performable unit and may appear in a variety of um, different publications. So here we've got the song Memory. That's the front cover of it there. Uh, by itself as a standalone publication of 15 pages. If I move on. Here we've got the Singer's Musical Theatre Anthology, which includes memory as one of 39 songs from lots of different musicals in one big fat publication. And finally, we've got the complete vocal score for the whole Cats musical, of which memory is just one constituent part. So we've got exactly the same music appearing in three different publications but the nature of those publications i'd suggest affects our perception of what constitutes the work so in the case of the score of the um, complete musical which has got a, a narrative running all the way through it i think we could feel on firm ground saying saying that cats is is the musical work and memory is just a part of that then Going to the other extreme, if we've got only our five page standalone publication of memory within that context, it's hard to consider memory as anything other than a work in its own right. And then in terms of the anthology, I think it's difficult to recognise the complete anthology as, as being a work it, itself. Rather, it's a publication comprising a collection of works. However, a single song from that anthology probably still only constitutes a small proportion of the overall publication and copying one song from it probably isn't unduly damaging the market for the entire anthology. So imagine ourselves in the position of the librarian receiving a request for the song whose view on whether they can fulfill that request may be fundamentally affected by the nature of the source publication it's requested from. A further complexity particular to musical works is that they have both a horizontal and a vertical aspect. 
So on the slide, the horizontal line represents linear time, whereas vertically we have all the instrumental parts that are playing concurrently. And for a, an orchestral work, there may be some 20 or more separate performing parts. So on uh, the left uh, here, uh, we have the first page of what's called uh, the full score, which includes all of the instruments. And on the right, we have a page of the uh, double bass part. So <clears throat> if you were playing the double bass, that performing part is all you'd be given. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it corresponds uh, with the, the bottom line on the stave on this left hand uh, page here. So the perspective of what constitutes uh, the work and a proportion of it would likely vary according to who placed the request and for what purpose. So considered vertically, this bass part is one of 16. <clears throat> And if a conductor was seeking a library privilege copy for the context of private study, maybe in deciding whether this was something that conductor would like to program and was provided with only the double bass part rather than the full score with all the instruments, they would take the view that they had only been provided with a very small proportion of that work. However, providing the double bass player with the exact same material from that performer's perspective would be providing them with the complete work. So that's a further example of the difficulties of defining a work where actually the context of the user and the use affects the perception of what constitutes the work. But if you're the librarian being asked to make a copy, that's a level of nuance that in the vast majority of services, it's, it's just no, not going to be pragmatic to interrogate. So we then went on to look at the wording of Section 42A and consider it within the context of other exceptions in the Act. Um, <clears throat> many of the exceptions are subject to a defence of fair dealing. Uh, including Section 29, the research and private study exception. So, of course, this exception is very closely related to Section 42A in that the outcome of the copying is for the same purpose, namely to get the copy into the hands of someone for the purpose of non-commercial research or private study. So it's perhaps puzzling that the language of the two sections isn't more closely aligned, in particular that the library privilege exception uses this term reasonable proportion, which appears nowhere else in the Act, rather than framing the exception within the requirement for fair dealing, which would be more consistent uh, with other exceptions. Um, indeed, whilst Section 29 does allow for the possibility of copying being taken undertaken by a person other than the researcher, the subsection 3A clarifies that where that person is a librarian, it's not fair dealing to do anything that isn't permitted under section 42A. So in a nutshell, the library privilege exception trumps section 29. What's not clear is whether that's supposed to indicate some interpretative difference between the terms reasonable proportion and fair dealing, or whether the matter purely relates to stopping librarians getting around the other requirements of Section 42A, such as not providing users with substantially the same material for substantially the same purpose. And I think overall, the latter is more likely, uh, particularly when considered within the context of the legislative changes in 2014. So as many of us will remember, those statutory instruments sought to implement the Hargreaves recommendations and the initial drafts were subject to a public consultation. Um, and the government's response to that consultation uh, stated that some respondents uh, suggested that reasonable proportion uh, be replaced with fair dealing, which you know I think many of us would think um, would be a very sensible uh, suggestion, which you know brings things much more sort of consistently aligned with other exceptions. And I've quoted on the slide what the government said in their response to that uh, suggestion, which is that they said that they'd use the existing CDPA language, that the current terminology hasn't been problematic and therefore the current drafting is retained. Now, they could have said something along the lines 
of that they weren't seeking to change the extent of what could be copied because you know, the point of this and the Hargreaves uh, uh, review was uh, recommending was that um, the exception is ex of a greater scope to include all types of copyright works where it was limited to only some before. Um, but I think the fact that they didn't say anything um, about um, not wanting to change the extent suggests to me that we can conclude they consider reasonable proportion and fair dealing to be pretty much synonymous. And if that's the case, that should possibly give us more confidence in having the flexibility to apply the more qualitative concepts of fairness on a case by case basis as part of an assessment of what might constitute a reasonable proportion, even though that phrase outwardly appears to have a more explicit, explicitly quantitative focus. So, for example, we know that case law exists in relation to other exceptions, um, such as quotation, where judgments have stated that the reproduction of a whole work can be said to meet the requirement uh, of fairness. Of course, fair dealing is yet another term that's not defined in the CDPA. And copyright commentators have put forward a range of factors for consideration. And there's a general consensus that a key precept of fairness is the impact of the dealing on the rights holder. Um, and Article 5, Section 5 of the uh, 2001 InfoSoc Directive, which itself uh, is derived from the Byrne three-step test, qualifies the circumstances under which specific acts of reproduction may made by publicly accessible libraries which are not for direct or indirect commercial advantage can apply and it states the exceptions and limitations provided for shall only be applied in certain special cases which do not conflict with a normal exploitation of the work or other subject matter and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the rights holder However, I'd suggest that this stipulation sits slightly at odds with section 42a if we consider that as a whole as we've already established, the provision for a library to supply a researcher with one article from a periodical was first introduced in the 1956 Act. And at that time, the only way of reading a single article would have been to purchase the entire periodical issue. So that at that time, an article was much more embedded um, as a constituent part of the whole. Obviously, with the advent of e-journals and new purchasing models, in many instances, it's now possible to purchase a single article from a periodical. But nevertheless, uh, the provision in Section 42A remains. And this arguably conflicts with a normal exploitation of the work and prejudices the legitimate interest of the rights holder. Though, again, it's a matter of judgment whether this could be said to be to an unreasonable extent. So I guess the question is, if the existence of subsection 1A may result in the rights holders being disadvantaged, is there any reason to need to give that consideration within the context of uh, subsection 1B? So to return to our earlier example of our song from a musical, a periodical issue is perhaps the closest equivalent to our musical anthology being a collection of individual works generally by different authors compiled into a single edited edition. And if a periodical article can be copied for a researcher, despite there being an option for them to purchase it themselves, I think one might argue that a librarian can copy a whole work from a musical anthology, even if that work is available to purchase individually. So bearing all those things in mind, <clears throat> We've plotted some of the activity that we know libraries already undertake on a risk continuum. All of these, we believe, could arguably be said to meet the reasonable proportion criteria. But those further to the right hand side are at the riskier end. So if we start at the left, the most conservative approach would be to take the most restrictive view of what constituted the complete work and limit copying to 5% of that which obviously in many instances would be of very little use to the user. Less cautious would be to not get caught up with this business of percentages, but nevertheless limit oneself to copying an amount that's less than what could be considered a performable unit. 
or going further, you might allow yourself to copy a performable unit, but only where the publication it's extracted from comprises the entire work. So thinking back to our earlier example, that would allow copying of the song Memory from the complete Cat's vocal score. Again, more liberally, you might take the view that an anthology publication should be considered in its entirety, and it would therefore be reasonable to copy five or 10% or in an individual work from that complete publication. And definitely at the riskier end would be to copy an entire performing part from an ensemble work. So in conclusion, library privileges, uh, library privilege exceptions apply to all types of copyright work. And in our view, excluding printed music from document supply services unfairly disadvantages researchers and practitioners in the field of music. Ultimately, it's for individual libraries to establish their own parameters based on their institution's risk profile, involving senior managers in those policy discussions and documenting them clearly so that frontline staff are empowered to apply them. One aspect that's challenging is that at least a basic level of musical literacy is likely to be required in all but the most clear cut examples, and that may not always exist within a library's document supply team. And if that's the case, mechanisms should be established in order to secure input from music subject specialists within the library or wider organisation. So that's it uh, in a nutshell. Um, I've put the URL on the screen, uh, which is where you can find the full report. And we'll um, add that into the chat shortly as well. And um, yeah, very happy to take any questions that anyone has on this. Claire, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. It was, uh, I mean, it's, as you've pointed out, uh, or as you've shown us in your presentation, um, there is, there's so much to think about when you're looking mm. at what the, the law actually says. Uh, so, I mean, I've got a whole load of things I wanted to pick up on. I do notice that um, Nora's got a question um, in there. So I think if, if, if we go to, to Nora's question first, which I, I think may actually start moving into the area of, of licenses that are available as well. So you've been looking at copyright exceptions, library privilege, which is in the exceptions. But Nora's question there is about a library copying a part of a musical score for an academic. Can this be uploaded to the VLE for students to view? So is that something which is just covered under the, the PLLL license clearly, or is there some element where this could be using library privilege? Um, I think um, a lot of this will, dispend, will depend on um, the extent of the score. I mean, obviously, a first thing to think about is a obviously be sure that the score is in copyright. So if it's if it's not in copyright, then then you can do whatever you want with it. But if it is in copyright, I think it, it will depend on the context of what the score is being used for, how much of it is being used. I mean, we mustn't forget that we've you know we've got our quotation exceptions, we've got our illustration for instruction uh, exceptions. So if it's um, a short section of, of a score, which is as much as is required to make a particular point or, or if the students are being asked to do an exercise on it, um, you know, do some harmonic analysis or something like that, um, I would think that um, in many instances you could use illustration uh, for for instruction if you're if it's you know as i say a small percentage of of, of a work now if it's it obviously depends on the subject and and the context in which it's being taught but if it were for example a whole movement or a whole song or something like that then i think at that point we're then uh, into the territory of um, of the higher education printed music license, and and you know it is it is a, a licensing route uh, at that point. So can we go but, if we can go back to your your scale here? This is you know it's obviously case specific what you're saying depending on exactly what it is that's being copied, but we're we're towards the more liberal end if you're starting to rely on exceptions for that purpose, given that you have a you, know, you have a license there that potentially is available to an institution to take out that would clearly cover that type of activity. Exactly, and I, I think you know it's it's tricky because there's there's all these different <clears throat> nuances depending on what exception we're talking about. Because obviously my presentation was was kind of basically within the whole context of of Section Forty Two A and library uh, privilege, um, but. Um, 
yeah I think I think you know we should always I would say always start with the act and the exceptions that 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 we have um and and it's only when you kind of think actually I don't think our use is covered by that that then then kind of go down the the licensing route uh, afterwards absolutely so I think and that follow-up so Nora saying if you don't have the license that would get I mean that's that's the it's not necessarily about getting into trouble it's the point is that that you just made there Claire is that the legislation is there to allow libraries to make content in their collections available to their users under specific terms so it's not necessarily a, a clear-cut case that but it's you know it, there's a license there that would allow you to use it but there's also potentially the exceptions that that could also be relied on. Um, so I wanted to go your, back to your conclusions and recommendations here, because I think this is the really important part of it, is that, that this needs to be understood within an institution. I think that's what your, your survey has, has pointed to, that, that these things need to be considered, particularly for, for libraries that are that have large music collections or important music collections and, and need to be serving their, their users uh, appropriately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because, you know, all libraries have some kind of established document supply uh, service and, and it, it, it does seem kind of perverse that, that you know, there are there are users who, who want access to, to this material. The, the law enables us to provide them with access to this material, but because of the complexities, the, the you know, the lack of confidence that that, that opportunity is, is kind of being withheld uh, from from a lot of people. So we are really very kind of keen to try and um, support libraries and, and help them with these you know, having put, set out some of these parameters and, and some issues for them to think about so that they can uh, make their own decisions and, and you know, be confident that, that they are able to provide this service on whichever terms they, <clears throat> they are willing to, to do based on their, their uh, risk appetite, basically. And so the thing that I'm also picked up in, in your presentation, talking about this musical literacy point, the subject specialism, uh, because what you've done in going through all the legislation is pointing out all the inconsistencies that there are in the drafting of the law. The fact that the law is not actually clearly written, you've got older versions of the legislation, you've got different sections which have a reasonable proportion of fair dealing. In my view, um, in my view, they're not synonymous from having looked at it. I think that reasonable proportion is talking about the quantity, the amount of the work, whereas fair dealing has that broader thought of, about those other tests that you go through to see whether something's fair. But I think that's just, that's the way, that's where we are. Um, uh, and, and actually when the laws that would be, legislation was being drafted, these things were really not thought through fully at the time. Music publishers certainly made their representations, the libraries did as well. But it's it's only you know, after the fact that you're we're trying to work out what the, the right thing to do is. But it's, it's that, you know, under, understanding what you're actually being asked for is a clear, seems to be a clearly important part um, because y your example of memories from cats well that is you know you could see how the, the publisher and the, the composers and the people that represent it say well that is a clearly a work in its own right I mean it's it's a pop song so it's a well-known song in its own right so presumably there may be that might be looked on differently to something which technically might be seen as a whole work but because it has a different life if you like it's not necessarily seen as a, a song in its own right I mean is, is that is that something for librarians to consider and if so how do they actually do that yeah I mean I, I think that this is what makes it all um so difficult and and uh, why it's hard for someone to make those those judgments you know frankly even if you are a music specialist let alone if you're if you're not um, the way that things are, are set out in in scores sometimes uh, doesn't help. Some, sometimes things are very clearly delineated. Other times um, they're they're not. And it's and as I say, it's kind of this paradox that you could have the same thing appearing in various different formats, which would kind of give you a different impression of. Of what is the work um, and and the status of of you know a subsection of a of a larger uh, work, um, 
yeah, I, I think I think you're right that um, from a rights holder point of view, they would probably take the view um, that anything which could essentially, you know, have a life by by itself, be performed uh, autonomously without needing all the contextual stuff that happens before or after of it, you know, to, to make sense, as it were, they would probably take the view that 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 is that is a work and therefore um, that uh, one ought not to, it, it's not reasonable to copy the, the whole of it. Um, so, you know, it's it's a broad spectrum. I think people just need to kind of decide where they're going to sort of stick their marker in, in the sand uh, yeah, on it. Absolutely, but, um, yeah. And I think you've made it very clear from this this findings that even if you're thinking about things from a percent, percent, percentage perspective, that sounds like clear cut. In fact, it's not because there's so many things that even go percentage of what. So you've pointed out whatever way you look at it, you need to spend some time thinking about it and make your own, you know, make your own each institution to have its own policy and a clear approach to it and to support their staff in doing that. But we would absolutely support. Yeah, I think these recommendations uh, are really interesting, Claire, actually. And I, I just wondered if, um, you know, it, YAML want, uh, are sort of planning to take things forward, because I'm sort of struck by thinking that, you know, there used to be that code of um, fair practice before the sort of license came in. Do you, do you think that something similar to what we're trying to do with audio visual works, um, a community based sort of developed code, not one developed by the music industry, but developed by our community, could that be something that's helpful? Or, or do you think, you know, that, that it would need to be done in collaboration? I mean, it's interesting because the code that exists um, uh, from the Music Publishers Association, it is theoretically um it, it have we got the example of it here it, it's the there we go i'm going to open it up there so you can actually see what it says uh, on the uh, front so what it says is the code of fair practice agreed between composers publishers and users of printed music now in practice what it is is that um the music publishers association writes it and then there are a lot, there are a number of organisations uh, who are kind of signed up to it un underneath. And that will in that includes uh, YAML, it will include things like um, Conservatoires UK and, and, you know, a lot of other sort of bodies. Um, but it's not, it's not a collaborative document. Basically, the MPA produces it. They say, oh, we've revised it, we've updated it. Are you still happy to have your name under it, basically? So it's it's you know it's, it's a bit different, isn't it? I think <laughs> it's it's not something where all the stakeholders are sort of you know, consulted in putting something together. No, it, it's no. a kind of here it is. Do you like it or do you not like it? And if you yeah. don't like it, it just means that your name won't come come under it. You know, rather than being something that is um, co-created. I think that's fair to say. So maybe this maybe this is an opportunity to well to, we we have to I suppose we see we see how it goes I mean we very much saw it that we're testing the water with audio visual works but actually it might then be something that we could use as a model to extend into other areas but maybe there's a sense that music is kind of more risky and it's not the first place to go not even the second place to go maybe it's one to look at down the line a bit um, I think it's interesting because I think with all with all audiovisual because they're uh, my understanding um with the sort of film stuff is that there isn't there isn't an existing code produced by anyone this is something that you know yeah you're thinking yeah. you're starting from scratch and i think it is possibly trickier when there is something which is <clears throat> already in existence but it has very much come from one end of the of the stake you know it's come from the rights holder perspective end rather than the starting from the sort of blank blank sheet as, as yeah. it were yeah i think yeah. this is it's it's really important and i think that the, the work that that um you've done on this and the rest of yaml is i think really helpful and you've done it i think a really excellent job of explaining that complexity but also laying out some clear examples so it's not just 
a load of questions. It's actually here are some things that you might do with your interpretation for for those mm. institutions to think through. So thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, no, I see thank we'll... you for the presentation, Claire. And and you've been a really valuable sort of adopted member of the UUK um, Guild HEC NAC committee as well with the work we did on the printed music license. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, Lots absolutely. Of nice yeah, so everyone's saying thank you to you and that's that's great and I think this may be something that we we return to so let us for the time that we have left which is kind of less time vastly uh, running we've out. gone <laughs> vastly running out so very very quickly the future webinars we have uh, in two weeks time Judy Noakes the copyright um, and crown copyright specialist from the National Archives joining us to talk through about use of government content and crown copyright uh, open government license so that should be very useful when uh, judy joined us at a at a sherlock when we used to meet face to face in london and the southeast to talk about copyright she came along and it was really useful so we're looking yeah, forward to that absolutely. very much yeah yeah um, and then judy we've got is a, a legend i believe is what somebody we, sent us an email saying recently. Yes, yes she definitely is um yeah. and and other slots we will let you know when we've got them firmed up but we've got a, a number of people that say that they're interested and in fact we do have the us team don't we the the um codes of best practice in fair use in oers have said we that do. they're very happy to join us so yes. watch this yes. space watch this space but the webinars next one it will be the 23rd so two weeks time and mm -hmm. we're continuing in may with that two week schedule as well and we'll be adding them to the web page when we've got uh, those details Great. so um i mean leaves yeah. us just with our one last thing chris really doesn't it, it does i will stop 